John's Gospel, chapter 1. If you're new today or have missed the last few weeks, we're in a series of messages beginning in John 1 and verse 1, and it will culminate in a few weeks at the end of John chapter 3. We'll obviously cover the famous verse, John 3.16, in this study in a subsequent week, but uh, today we're going to be in John chapter 1. I'll be reading in just a moment, beginning in verse 43. Um, I attended both a liberal arts college and seminary, and as a result of that, there's one thing that was very true. I had to take a music appreciation course in each school. Now, um, that was a challenge for me uh, because I'm musically challenged. Um, and if you say music appreciation, you can graduate, you can finish that course, you don't have to read music or anything. All you have to do is appreciate music. Well, I appreciate it before I took it. But it was really amusing, and I see some other Hamden Sydney students, y'all may have had the same requirement, but I had Professor Kidd at Hamden Sydney, and when I was there, the culmination of our first semester was a joint concert with girls from Randolph-Macon Women's College. Now, um, I enjoyed the concert, but I actually enjoyed seeing the girls. Now, before you judge me, that was three years before I met my wife. <laughs> And you've never been to an all-male college. If you can imagine what it's like, you look around and you see a lot of ugly guys through the week. It's almost a joy uh, to be able to, to do that. But I still wonder about Professor Kidd, who was so gifted in music to take a ragtag group like we were, and we knew very little, but somehow we got through that. So I graduated from Hamden Sydney College, and I said, okay, I've checked out that box, no more music appreciation. I received the core curriculum requirements at seminary, and you guessed it, music appreciation. Now, I was at a co-ed school. I had a girlfriend already who would be my wife, so there was really no motivation uh, for the course, uh, but I got through it uh, okay. But one of the privileges of taking music appreciation at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary was I studied under... Uh, a man named William Reynolds. Now, I use that word studied loosely because we're just at a, uh, a light level type of course in, in that. But I was thinking this past week, I was at a school of theology studying under great theologians, but it's very interesting that all of the theology classes, New Testament, Old Testament, uh, preaching classes, theology. Out of all of the professors I had, the most acclaimed professor happened to have been the music professor. And the man, as I mentioned, William Reynolds, um, was a well-known uh, songwriter and musician. Uh, many of you have heard the hymn, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus, that we use in hymns. He wrote the music for that particular song. And there's another song that's in every hymnal since 1973 when he both wrote and put the music to it, the song Share His Love. It also is often shared in invitations in Baptist churches. Again, written in 1973, the chorus goes like this, Share His Love by telling what the Lord has done for you. Share His Lord by sharing of your faith. And show the world that Jesus Christ is real to you every moment, every day. What beautiful words about the responsibility and the privilege we have as Christians. We've been talking for these past few weeks. We have a story to tell. God has given us our story, which is a personal story, and he has given us his story, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And many times it's great to see that God can use us, mere individuals, to share both our story and his story to add individuals to his kingdom. Last week we saw that with Andrew, who brought his brother Simon. This week, we're going to see another, Philip, who followed Jesus and then went and shared with Nathaniel, and Nathaniel himself became a follower of Christ. Look with me this morning at John chapter 1, beginning in verse 43. 
It says the next day, that is the day after Andrew brought Simon Peter to the Lord, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee and he found Philip and told him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, hometown of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law. And so did the prophets, Jesus, the son of Nazareth, or the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathanael asked him. Come and see, Philip answered. Then Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and, and said about him, Here truly is an Israelite in, in whom is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you, Jesus answered. Rabbi, which was really the most high statement Nathanael could use, Nathanael replied, You're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. Jesus responded to him, do you believe because I told you, I saw you under the fig tree, you will see greater things than this. Then he said, I truly tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Let's pray. Fathers, we look to your word today, the simple gospel of John communicating the effectiveness of a personal story combined with the gospel message. Father, how we have been delinquent in carrying out this basic privilege and responsibility of the Christian life. And so in this hour, Lord, I pray you would convince us that we might move to develop that story, to articulate it, that people might believe in you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, here in John chapter 1, we're really seeing the great handoff, the great exchange. John the Baptist, as we said, John the Baptizer uh, was on this earth and he came and the Old Testament prophets attested to the fact beforehand that he came in order to basically pave the way for Jesus to set the table. And so he preached a message, repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. The Messiah is coming. And so we saw last week how John the Baptist who knew about Jesus actually came to personally know Jesus through the work of the Holy Spirit as he abided on Jesus uh, as John was looking. And so now John, who had fulfilled his ministry, basically is moving out of the limelight into the background. He, he wasn't there to wave his hands to say, hey, I'm that guy that Herod feared. I, I'm that one that Jesus spoke great words of. No, in a humble way, he began to release his disciples to Jesus Christ. Last week we saw that Andrew heard and the first thing he did was he found his brother Simon Peter and he told him the story. And today we see that Philip, after following Jesus, uh, goes to Nathaniel and shares with Nathaniel. And Nathaniel, who originally was hardened to the fact that Jesus was the Messiah, began to soften and, and he followed the Lord. And so very early in Jesus' public ministry, and we're right here at the beginning of his public ministry. Next week, we're going to look at his first public miracle, the wedding at Cana of Galilee. But we see very early what is the norm, person to person, one person hearing and sharing with another person. Somehow that's been lost over the ages, but it is the norm for someone who hears to share with someone else. This morning, I want to look at Philip's interaction with Nathaniel. And I want to look at three tools specifically that he used to communicate the truth of Jesus to Nathaniel. And then I want to look at Nathaniel, how he was transformed, and then a truth that is very important for us to understand today about the Christian life. But first, I want to see Philip's invitation to Nathaniel. And we see it in the verses we just read in, in verses 43 through 46. It tells us in verse 43, the next day, again, that was the day after he had uh, interacted with John the Baptist, uh, Andrew believed, and Simon Peter believed. It said the next day he decided to leave uh, for Galilee. 
Now, Galilee was a northern territory. He had been in Bethany and near the Jordan, and so he wasn't going to just stay in one place. It was often the case in Jesus' public ministry. He moved from one area to another, and that's important, as we'll see later. And, and so we see that he heads north uh, to Galilee, and in that region was a town called Bethsaida. And it tells us in verse 44 that Philip was from Bethsaida. And we don't know if they met at Bethsaida. It just says where Philip was from. But Philip was uh, from Galilee, that territory, and specifically the hometown, Bethsaida. It's very interesting, and this is just a side note, but three of the first disciples, the first three who were called initially to believe, were from Bethsaida. Bethsaida was located near Capernaum, which is at the cap or the top uh, of the Sea of Galilee. And, and the name Bethsaida means house of hunting. And it's very interesting that the this one Philip, who was from Bethsaida, went on the hunt, uh, being true to the name of his hometown, to one of his friends, Nathaniel. And he shared Christ with Nathaniel. You know, if we are to be effective in God's kingdom, if we're to experience the joy of being used to lead people to Christ, we see in our text today three tools that can be at our disposal. And, and there are times we might use just one. And there's another time where we say, well, this tool doesn't work. I'll use another. And then sometimes all three can be used. And I want to look at those this morning because Philip uses all three. The first is this. He uses the tool of his own testimony. He uses the tool of his own story. He gave a testimony. Now, Christian, testimonies are powerful things. I had the blessing this week at Revival. Every night, Mary and Bo decided they were going to add the personal testimony to the preaching. And the personal testimony is very simple. Every Christian has a testimony. It was interesting to me. We saw young Liam, who trusted Christ through our ministry, Liam Steinrock, Royal Rangers, share his testimony. He was very young. I'm not sure, maybe eight, maybe nine years old. He shared his testimony. Every one of us has a, a story. And at least two things are true of a personal testimony. First, it is uncontestable. You can't tell me, nor can you write my story. If I share my story, that's my story. And, and, and so it is uncontestable. People may contest many things. They may say you're crazy, but they have to understand what you believe. But secondly, it's relatable. When you share a story, it's relatable. You know, years ago, for those who are older, you remember the pot belly stoves and people sitting around the country stores and, ex uh, and exchanging stories. Or you go in a barber shop or whatever. People are relational. They love to hear stories. We have the opportunity to share our story. Now, listen, your story doesn't have to be communicated in a long version. You can give a brief version. In fact, it is better to keep it shorter. <laughs> I was reading this past week a, a book on, on rest, and the author of the book is talking about how in this information age in which we live, people have such quick access to information that mankind's attention span is one half now what it was uh, 20 years ago. You're saying, well, Rick, that means you need to get through this message, okay? But the personal testimony, you don't have to share 20 minutes. In fact, I don't know many people that will sit and listen to you 20 minutes. But there are ways that in 90 seconds to two minutes, you can communicate your story to someone. And it's powerful. Hey, you don't have to be a preacher to do it. Look at these two individuals that we've looked at at the beginning. We looked at Andrew last week. We looked at Philip. They just became believers. And simply put, they said, this is my story. We found the one. Every one of us can share the story. And it's not to give a dissertation. 
Because if we give a dissertation, let's go off to school somewhere. No, it is to simply share how Jesus impacted your life and my life. Now, the responsibility of us as Christians is this. We need to practice our testimony. You say, well, I don't want to practice my testimony. That's making it too formal. Well, you practice everything else. Whatever profession you're doing, you try to perfect it by doing what? By honing the skills, by developing it. So you begin to work on your testimony. Every testimony has three points. My life first before I came to know Jesus. And that's various. Last night, we are two testimonies at the revival. One, the individual grew up in a perfect Christian home, was still a sinner, and shared Christ. Now, her life before Jesus, she didn't make up a bunch of stuff. She followed the girl who had the previous testimony. She said, my testimony is different. The first girl who shared grew up in a situation much rougher than any of us could ever imagine. Both of them had a story about Jesus, but each story was unique. Uh, specifically in regard to the life before Christ. But then secondly, how I came to know Jesus. That's the second part. So you're saying, this is where I was. How did I come to know Jesus? We looked at John the Baptist last week. He said twice in our text, I didn't know him. Even though he was related, he may have known about him. He said, I didn't personally know him until the spirit rested upon him. And that spirit resting upon him, when he rested upon Jesus, what he said is, That's how I came to know Christ. For me, I came to know Christ in 1974, sitting fourth row to the right from where the pulpit is, listening to and watching a movie and responding to the gospel message. And so how I came to know Jesus. But then there's a third point. My life since I've known Jesus. So there's before Christ. There's how I came to know Christ and my life after Christ. Now, very interesting. There's some limitations that uh, Andrew had last week and Philip has this week that we don't have. And it's this. They didn't have longevity in the faith. They heard and they immediately went. Now, the beauty of that is you don't have to uh, have walked with the Lord for 50 years to share a testimony. It's just sharing. And so in neither of these testimonies we looked at the past two weeks, is there much mention about the life after Christ? Why? Because they believe Christ and they said, let me tell you this. But if you've been a believer for a number of years, a large part of your testimony can be what God has done in your life since you believed in him. You know, I went through and I struggled with this and and God helped me. Or I went through this loss or I went through that and I found that God did this for me. There's a power in having a testimony if you've been a believer for a number of years. Now, the testimony today was this, very simple. Philip goes to Nathaniel and said, we have found the Messiah. We see the personal aspect, not there's a Messiah out there or there's a message. We have found him. And that's what a personal testimony. It is using your own story. Secondly, we see that he uses the tool of Jesus story. Now, I'm not a handyman by any means. In fact, Paul put me in that picture. I want to add a disclaimer All of the skill came from every other guy that was there, all right? I can tote something, but I'm not gifted that way. I'm going to be first, uh, and I see uh, Donald back there laughing. He knows. But I know enough to know this. One tool isn't enough on a job like that. There were times when Donald would say, or Paul, or David, or JC, they'd say, well, we need this. JC might say, well, I've got this. JC, I think Rand is house and back. Uh, You know, we got this, and we need this, and we need that. We might need a screwdriver for that. We might need a drill for that. And, And so what's happening is we're going through the project, and you stop, and you say, this brings it to a certain point. But you know, if I'm going to go for, further, I need another tool. And so Philip doesn't just say we have found the Messiah and leave him waiting. But he begins to share the gospel. He uses this second tool. He tells not only his story, we found the Messiah, but he begins to tell Jesus' story, the gospel. And the gospel is this. Every one of us is a sinner. No matter how we look on the outside, 
we're sinners. We're not good by nature. We're sinners by nature. That's why we have to teach our children how to do right and not do wrong. And guess what? Our parents had to teach us how to do right and not to do wrong because by nature we're sinners. Every person is a sinner. And the consequence of that sin is it separates us from God who is holy. God is without sin. And praise God, he loved us enough to send Jesus to die for us. And Jesus was perfect. The problem with our sin is not only are we separated now, but if we don't do something consciously in our life, and that is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll be eternally separated from God in a place called hell. It's not like over time we're just assimilated into the kingdom. It does not work that way. Unless we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we're separated from God eternally. And apart from the fire and the gnashing of the teeth, there's none of that that is worse than being eternally separated from God who is light and who is good and who is love. But the glorious message of the gospel is that Jesus did come, as we see here in John 1. And subsequent to that, he did die, and he was raised from the dead, and he did ascend to heaven, and he is coming back. And if anyone would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, man, woman, boy, girl, that one would be saved. Well, at this stage, very simply put, Philip didn't have all of the story of Jesus. Why is that? Because there were still three more years of public ministry before Jesus would die. But he still was able to tell the story of Jesus because in the eyes of faith before Christ died, he knew Jesus is the one. What does he say? He says that Jesus is the focus of Moses' ministry. Notice what he says in verse 45. We have found the one. But then he adds to it the story Moses wrote about in the law. Now, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. In Genesis 3, verse 15, Jesus is the one who's going to draw the death blow on the devil. And we see also in, in uh, chapter 49, in verse 10, he would be the one who would come from Judah. And in Deuteronomy 18, in verse 18, we see that he is the one greater than Moses in the spirit of Moses who would come. He is the focus of Moses' writing, but Jesus is also the focus of the prophets. In fact, a lot of people say that in the Old Testament is the gospel concealed and the New Testament is the gospel revealed when people began to see Christ as the resurrected Lord. In Isaiah 53, the prophet pictures the suffering servant. Jesus was the one who came to suffer. In Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, the one born in Bethlehem who would save us from our sins. In Jeremiah 23 verses 5 and 6, the descendant of David, the rightful righteous branch who would rule. And so basically uh, God's spirit gave the understanding to Philip where he could say, we have found the one who has filled everything that has been said in the Old Testament. And so when we share his story, we share the message of Jesus Christ. But we have such an advantage over these two early disciples. We have the whole story of the death, the burial, and the resurrection. You know, Jesus arose from the dead. And because he arose from the dead, we have hope. He's coming. He's coming again. So he uses the tool of Jesus' story. But then I want you to see a third tool he uses. Because sometimes when we're on that job, the first tool gets us to a point. A second one maybe is effective. But we need a third tool. And the third tool is a tool of personal invitation. That is, to me, the easiest tool. Come with me to church. Join me. It's an effective tool. A study by Lifeway Publications in 2014, listen to this, said that two in three people will respond positively to an invitation from a family member. Just asking. 63% said that if a friend asked them to attend church, they would seriously consider doing it. Now, the percentage drops 
to 33% if somebody just knocks on the door that you don't know and says, come with me to church. Still, one in three isn't bad. That means if you knock on three homes, one of them would be receptive. Uh, we've been working on the mailings, and we sent out a number of mailings. You may have gotten some. If we misspelled your name, we apologize, all right? But I saw somebody at, at Millbrook that received one of them. All right, and that opened up an opportunity for personal invitation. Now, it's said that these mailings, about 2 to 3%, maybe 4 or 5% is effective. What's the most effective? A family member inviting a family member. Very close to that, a friend inviting a friend. And then just inviting someone and then sending out a card. Hey, even the number of cards, I would take 2 or 3% if we would have that. But here's the point. A study four years later after that LifeWay study said that only 29% of Christians have ever invited someone to come to church with them. Philip used the tool of the personal invitation. Look at verse 46. Uh, Nathaniel was uh, being cynical here. Can anything good? What did Philip say? He didn't stop and say, well, let me preach to you a four-point message. Let me take a long time to share my story. He just invited him. Come and see. Come and see. We've got a gentleman toward the back. Russell Weddington's a buddy of mine. And I share his story many places. He invites tons of people. If you're here today and Russell ever invited you to come to Concord, raise your hand if you're here today. I see, I see three, four back there, all right? Now, Russell would tell you that wasn't too hard. Ru Russell's got a great plan. He'll do people a favor and then say, come to church with me. <laughs> hey, it works, doesn't it? Personal invitation. Guess what? They won't come if you don't ask them. You may ask them and they may not come or it may take six months or six years. Philip said, come and see. Well, real quickly, let's look at the transformation of Nathaniel. He heard this, the story of Philip. We found the Messiah. He, he heard that the story of Jesus, that he fulfilled the, the word from Moses, the, the, the word of the prophets. He, he received the tool of the personal invitation. He heard, come and see. Now, Nathaniel was a cynic. He was a hard, sarcastic person. A cynic is hardened. A cynic has a preconceived notion. I'm not going to believe anything. He said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, he wasn't too far off on that. Because in the study I did this week on Nazareth, Josephus didn't mention any time in his writings about Nazareth. In, in the Old Testament, uh, there's no real reference to Nazareth. Nazareth might be that spot on the map that we would consider insignificant. From my Karen's hometown, it would be Polk County. And so the idea here is, can anything good come out of that? And so at the beginning, where do we find Nathaniel? A doubter. He is on the side, I won't believe. Now, Philip, did he just say, oh, yeah, you're right? And say, well, I give up on that one. There's got to be somebody easier. No, he said, come and see. And it's great because Jesus saw inside Nathaniel's heart. And he said, this is a man without guile. Outwardly, he may have been sarcastic, but inwardly, he was pure. Inwardly, he was sincere. Some people may appear to be good on the outside and on the inside are not right, but here we see someone on the outside that we might think was hardened. But Jesus saw the heart and he said, this is a sincere man. There are sincere people in our community who need to hear the gospel. They may be outwardly gruff. They may uh, give the appearance they wouldn't believe they deserve to hear. When well, these few verses, Nathaniel moves from doubter to disciple. Jesus told something that surprised Nathaniel. Jesus had seen him, and Nathaniel said, what in the world's going on here? How did you know it? And then Jesus said, you'll see greater things than these. And he did. He inferred that Nathaniel's encounter with Jesus wasn't just at that moment, but he would see something in the future, and this is important. 
he knew Nathaniel would be one of the 12 apostles. Now, if you study it closely, last week, Andrew and Peter, they were called to believe first, but after that, at a subsequent time, they were called to be fishers of men, to be apostles. Because the call that we see here in John chapter 1, and Andrew and Peter were the first who were called, this call to believe was in Bethany, down in Judah, not in Galilee. But they were in Galilee when they were called to be apostles. So there was the call to believe, which we see here in John chapter 1 of these four disciples. And subsequent to that, Jesus said, come and follow me. And so when he says here, you'll see greater things than these, he knew that he had a plan that went beyond just that moment for Nathaniel. And he has a plan for your life. You may not see it, but he sees it. I thought after Jesus' three years of public ministry, this was not Nathaniel. He didn't say, oh yeah, I remember three years ago when he told me something about myself I didn't know. No, he had a lot to tell because it wasn't just that he believed in the past and walked down an aisle and lived his own life. He followed Jesus day by day and he had a story to tell and we have that story. I wonder today, do you know him? Are you following him? Concerning his life, we know that Nathaniel did tell his story. You say, well, preach, he didn't tell it here. Philip told Nathaniel. But there's no record of Nathaniel telling anybody. Well, quite contrary to that, he does tell. Because in Matthew chapter 10, as Jesus commissioned the 12 out, Nathaniel was in that group. And what was the main thing expected in Matthew 10, 7? Jesus sent him with the other 11 out and said, announce the kingdom of God is at hand. He was to tell the story. And you and I are to tell the story. You know, in closing the second verse of Professor Reynolds' hymn, Share His Love, goes as follows. All those who have trusted in God's only Son and hold this precious treasure in their hearts seek ways to make it known to all who need to know that God so loved the world His only Son He gave. Seek ways. That's what the song says. Seek ways, find that tool. One way may be share your personal testimony. Are you going to work on it? Are you going to develop it? The, how, how your life was before Christ, how you came to know Christ, how God makes your life different in Christ. Share his story. Will you familiarize yourself in a way that you can communicate the gospel clearly in a way that someone can understand? Share an invitation. Invite someone to come out. You know, it's our mandate and our privilege. How will they hear? How will they hear if we don't tell them? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the tools that Philip used. Even as an early believer, he was able to access three tools that many of us who have been believers for years also have. Father, we pray, and not just for the 21st, but especially on May 21st, that, Father, there would be a great inpouring of people to hear the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, Lord, I pray that uh, you would bless us with good weather, that, Lord... Um, you would bring many people out. But Lord, you've given us the responsibility to invite. And so Lord, if there be any today who have not trusted Christ, I pray today in their hearts that they would be convinced of the truth that Jesus loved them, that they are sinners, but that Christ died for them and that he arose and that if they would repent and believe, they'll be in right standing with you. And we lift this prayer in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. I don't know how God has spoken to you today.